did not know what hybrid revascularization was until Dr. Jacobov just uh, described it to me. We'll all be learning a little bit about this technique, which uh, seems to combine uh, some aspects of open heart surgery and also some aspects of <coughs> coronary intervention. We're kind of marrying the two procedures together. Dr. Jacobliff is uh, down at Montefiore Hospital. He has a very interesting background. He started off at, in nursing, and apparently he did a rotation here, you said, a number of That's years correct. ago in the nursing staff, and then he went on to uh, study uh, medicine and uh, cardiac surgery. And uh, he's been very active in the Montefiore uh, program. And I'll, I'll turn it over to Dr. Jacobliff. So let me know if we get interference from the two mics and we'll switch this one off. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to speak here this morning. We're going to talk on uh, an important topic to us in the world of cardiac surgery as well as cardiology, and that is hybrid revascularization. Why we do it, how we, when we do it, and how we do it. Um, my background in cardiac surgery does span the gamut of cardiac surgery. You can, under, you can imagine that as the, young, the youngest person in the practice, um, there's nothing in cardiac surgery that I don't do, and that includes minimally invasive surgery, valve surgery, transplant surgery, uh, and the traditional coronary bypass uh, surgery as well. Um, I do not have any financial disclosures, and we will not make reference to any specific um, uh, pieces of equipment here in this presentation, except for the use of the robot, which uh, for all intents and purposes is the Da Vinci robot, which we have at Montefiore. What is it that makes cardiac surgery, whether it be for coronary bypass or for valve surgery, so invasive? Well, we perform a median sternotomy, which involves taking the sternum and uh, using a saw and taking it in half, into two halves. That ultimately, postoperatively, creates a lot of pain. There's a risk of 2 to 4% for wound infection. Um, they can have pulmonary dysfunction. You can well imagine that if you open a sternum, the pulmonary hemodynamics are not the same as if that sternum were to remain intact. Um, the act of actually spreading the sternum can put tension on the brachial plexus, and you can have brachial plexus injury. Certainly, there's the risk of bleeding. And then, uh, lastly, the cosmesis of the procedure. It is by, by no means a very cosmetic procedure. You will have a line down the front of your chest um, for the remainder of your life. Now, we do minimize that that incision quite a bit. That incision today uh, can be as small as five inches, and depending on the sternum, can be as long as eight inches. But once again, the importance um, of cosmesis is, uh, is not achieved for some of the patients. Doing it open, uh, or not minimally invasive, requires the patient to be put on cardiopulmonary bypass. Putting the patient on cardiopulmonary bypass has a number of uh, problems as well. There's a tremendous uh, release of inflammatory cytokines and mediators. Um, patients have been shown uh, to have cognitive, de cognitive defects and deficits, and those are uh, terms that you'll, you've heard in the past of pump head and things of that sort. Uh, patients do develop coagulopathy. They do get hemodiluted, um, but I will say that at Montefiore, all of our circuits are created for the patient specifically. So, Every patient does not receive the same size circuit when they're on cardiopulmonary bypass, and that allows us to effectively hemoconcentrate so we avoid the hemodilution that we typically see uh, with ordinary cardiopulmonary bypass. And then the last thing that cardiopulmonary bypass actually affords us is the ability to uh, provide myocardial protection. And this is done in two, in two ways, one by hypothermia, decreasing the patient's core body temperature to 32 degrees or 34 degrees uh, centigrade, and also by delivering cold cardioplegia to the heart. So the combination of the cold plus the cardioplegia decreases the um, metabolic activity of that myocardium uh, to a very low level, thereby making it a very safe procedure to perform in the open setting. Now, what is an acceptable alternative to minimally, for minimally invasive uh, Lima to LAD strategy? Now, here we're speaking strictly about the Lima to the LAD. The uh, LAD is the left anterior descending artery on the heart. That supplies two-thirds of the blood supply to the uh, septum. The other third comes from the uh, PDA. Now, 
You lose the LAD, we all know what happens. It's called the Widowmaker, and it's not called that for no reason. And over years, um, there have been a number of operations that, have, that we've come to know uh, to deal with the Lima to LAD in other ways other than median sternotomy. The one was the mid, the, the mid cap, all right? This is, a, this is a procedure where it's a, a very small incision. You take down the mammary artery, you, you spread the rib, you see the uh, LAD, and you anastomose that Lima to its LAD. The endo A cab is an atraumatic endoscopic version, or thoracoscopic, if you will, um, atraumatic uh, coronary bypass, and that's done with thoracoscopes, much like you see Dr. Marav use here for uh, minimally invasive thoracic surgery. And that involves essentially three ports through which you put a camera, two graspers, and uh, um, you're able to take down your left internal mammary artery, which you see here. It also does require the incision uh, in the intercostal space through which you will perform your actual lima to LED or lima to uh, diag anastomosis. Other method is a little bit more along the lines of what we discussed earlier about involving myocardial protection, and that is an arrested heart um, TCAB. So it's, again, put the patient on bypass through the femoral. Um, you can put a, an endoaortic balloon in. You can deliver cardioplegia through that balloon system, and you can arrest the heart and do the same procedure on the arrested heart. The ideal uh, procedure, however, remains, if you're going to look at all of these procedures, remains the beating heart TCAB. And this doesn't show up here very well, but this is done essentially robotically assisted, where we take down the left internal mammary artery uh, with the robot. We then do the same incision that you see here in the intercostal space, overlying the LAD, and then perform our um, Lima to LAD anastomosis on the beating heart. Now, I will say that uh, in doing so, a number of things are, uh, there are a number of uh, things to encounter when you do this, and that, first and namely, most foremost, you have to have a favorable LED target. If the target is small, the target is very diseased, the target is difficult to find, um, it's not going to be uh, a favorable procedure for a beating heart uh, bypass. Now, when we do this robotically, You've all seen the uh, Da Vinci robot. This is the, the uh, main robotic arm setup. We use the HD, the HD robot. Um, we have a console over in the corner, and you essentially see everything in 3D uh, as you sit in the console. Once we've taken down the actual mammary artery uh, robotically, we then put a retractor into the intercostal space, which is shown here. We place another retractor through a small port here. That's a stabilizer, actually, that comes up and pushes down on the myocardium. And then here you see patient's feet would be over here. Here you see the lima coming down and being an actually anastomosed to the uh, LED with the stabilizer in place. At the completion of the procedure, what you end up with is incision for the stabilizer, incision for your anastomosis, and um, you'll have your port incisions as well for your robot. Um, when we look at what the patient position is in the OR itself, this is what the typical patient uh, looks like. But we put, oh, sorry, we put a um, IV bag under the patient's left chest, sort of to rotate the patient a little bit, take the left arm, pull it downward. So now we essentially have the entire um, left chest exposed, and that allows us to now place our camera ports for our robot. And this is what it looks like when the entire um, robotic system is in place and we're able to perform the robotic surgery. Now, this really requires two people. One person, either our scrub nurse or a resident, um, is at the bedside and that person does nothing but change these little arms because these are graspers, these are clip appliers, these are scissors, and so or cautery, which most of our work is done with when we take down the uh, internal mammary artery. Um, and then the surgeon actually sits at the console, which is on the other side of the room. Um, again, a little bigger incision. This is robotic takedown. This is what it will look like with the ports in place. You see the, you see the actual um, stabilizer port here. You get, a, get an idea of where the uh, LAD is sitting here in this hole. This is really only about two inches in, in width. 
um, it's actually bigger in terms of the incision, but the actual hole that you're working through is about two inches. It's the width of the little retractor that you see right here. Okay, and once again, on the bottom left here, you see the um, actual Levita LED completed with the stabilizer in place. Now, what are the applications for minimally invasive coronary bypass grafting? Well, first of all, it's applicable to isolated LAD or diagonal disease. It's also applicable to isolated left, osteo left main uh, osteal disease. We can also perform partial revascularization in high-risk patients. We can also do what we're here to talk about today, and that is hybrid coronary revascularization. And hybrid coronary revascularization is defined as the planned use of a minimally invasive Levita LED revascularization and PCI. So we actually plan that. It's not that we get to the operating room, we perform a minimally invasive Levita LED and say, well, I was unable to reach the other targets, so now I'm gonna send the patient to the lab. No, these patients are discussed um, with our cath lab colleagues beforehand, and we have a, a very clearly defined plan as to when this patient is going to go to the cath lab to have their, their uh, PCI. And you'll see we'll go over some data uh, in a little while as to whether we do it before or after, what the pros and what the cons are of that. Now, what are the techniques of hybrid coronary revascularization? Well, we can do PCI first, and then we can do the minimally invasive cabbage using the robot or using any of those methods that you were, you were shown earlier. We can do the, the minimally invasive cabbage, and then we can do the PCI, or we can do them simultaneous. Now, how do we do that? That's done in a hybrid lab. So at Montefiore, we have a hybrid laboratory. We bring the patient to the hybrid lab. We do one of those procedures first, but we say they're simultaneous because we're doing them right on the same table, so the patient is not moved from the table to get the complete procedure. And again, that's done in many centers today, especially with the advent of hybrid rooms in most medical centers. Um, why do we do this hybrid coronary revascularization? And this is one of the important objectives to understand. Well, first of all, a patent Lima to LAD uh, anastomosis is what confers the major survival advantage in all patients. This is true both for open heart surgery, where we actually do through full sternotomy, do the same procedure through a full sternotomy, or do it minimally invasive. That's the graft that's going to purport the greatest um, survival uh, advantage for your patient. Um, the minimally invasive cabbage itself reduces post-op adverse events and allows for a quicker recovery compared, compared to conventional cabbage. And you'll see the patients will complain of a significant amount of pain on post-op day one, post-op day two, because of the act of spreading that uh, intercostal space. But I will tell you that um, not having to worry about the risk of sternal infection in many of these patients, as you know, they have diabetes, and that's a significant risk for us. So not having to worry about that, doing this minimally invasive if they only need one vessel or possibly two um, is ideal. And lastly, the patency of drug-eluting stents and saphenous vein grafts to non-LAD targets, so to circumflex or diagonal vessels, really appears at this point to be at best equipped. Now, what is that? Saphenous vein graft at five years to a non-LAD target has a patency rate of about 85 to 89 percent, depending on which paper you read. What's the patency rate of the Lima to LAD anastomosis uh, in, at five years? It's about 95 to 98 percent, and I can tell you that today, I'm operating on the patients that had surgery by Dr. Marab and Dr. Uh, Atai at our institution 30 years ago, and they're coming back with patent limit LED and many times even uh, one or two of the vein grafts being patent. So um, it does work. Um, we know that, and that's been borne out in the literature. Now, in addition to that, we try to minimize the repeat revascularization as compared to multivessel stenting. As we all know, stents um, do require, in some patients, multiple, in, multiple re interventions. That multiple re intervention rate purports risk to the patient. Every time a femoral artery is accessed, every time a catheter or guide wire is passed through that aorta, those are all points at which that patient can have a plaque disrupted in the aorta and they can have a stroke. And when you see a 47 year old that came in for a simple stent, who uh, is lying in bed drooling without their left side moving. 
it's pretty devastating to see. Not to say that cardiac surgery uh, itself doesn't have its risk of stroke, but nonetheless, the repeat revascularization rate with stents is high. Now, again, what are the angiographic PCI criteria? Why is it that we, we when do we want to do this hybrid uh, revascularization? Well, first of all, there has to be an expected either prognostic or symptomatic benefit from the LEMA to LAD anastomosis. There is expected similar patency with PCI and, and saphenous vein to a non-LAD target, so if we plan to do um, that uh, vein graft to an LAD, um, and certainly now we're talking about doing a stent, to, uh, sorry, a vein graft to a diagonal vessel or, or circumflex, and now we're talking about putting a stent to it, um, there's similar patency in those two things. And that's what lends uh, itself to doing this procedure. In addition, the high-risk PCI of the LAD, either in short or long term, also bears its effect on these patients. And then, <clears throat> how do we perform it when? Well, if the complex LAD lesion with a high syntax score, that's the patient that we would do this procedure on. This is a short segment non-LAD lesion with a low syntax score. So, the patient that has that lesion in the diagonal vessel, the patient that has a short lesion in the um, circumflex system, or short segment lesion even in the uh, right coronary system with a low syntax score. Those are the patients that we would perform uh, the, the procedure on. They have to be able to, to tolerate uh, uninterrupted dual platelet therapy, however, because the patients are given dual platelet therapy who undergo this procedure. In addition, they have to have an expected survival of greater than a year. Patients that are not going to survive, or that we expect to survive at least a year, are really not candidates for this procedure. In addition, they shouldn't have had any prior lung resection surgery. Even something as simple as a wedge resection creates significant adhesion, and what you don't want to do is access that pleural space and have problems where the lung is adhesed to the uh, pleura and also no prior left thoracotomy. So an actual incision in the chest um, certainly, again, creates a tremendous amount of adhesion. Um, they have to have favorable chest wall anatomy. The patients that are barrel chested, um, that makes that, that, makes that lima to LED, that lima takedown robotically quite a, quite a challenge just because of the location of the lima uh, on the chest wall sort of makes its way into the intercostal spaces and does not make it uh, easy to take that down. Um, they have to be able to tolerate single lung ventilation. Why? These patients all get intubated with a dual lumen tube. We drop the left lung and this patient is ventilated um, for the most part, for the better part of the surgery uh, with a single lung. In addition, they have to have a good distal LAD target. So a patient that has a very small LAD is not going to be a favorable candidate for this procedure. And you can well imagine that if the heart is moving and you're trying to anastomose the left internal mammary artery, which usually is a favorable size in everyone, to an LAD target that's a millimeter, it's not going to go very well. Okay? And that's something that you try, to, you try to assess angiographically as well when we look at the actual relationship of the LAD once it's got its contrast in it to the actual catheter that they're performing the uh, cardiac catheter. In addition, that LAD cannot be intramyocardial. If the LAD is intramyocardial, it's almost impossible to find. And the last thing you want to do is take down the left internal mammary artery and not be able to find the target to which you, you want to anastomose it. Um, and that, when we, again, when we look at the cath, we can tell very easily. When you look at the cath and you watch the flow, the contrast through that catheterization and through the LAD, you'll see this squeezing that goes along the LAD, that's an LAD that's intramyocardial, and that's not a favorable uh, anatomy for this procedure. Now, what are some of the variables? Well, we do it as a stage procedure, or do we do it simultaneously? <coughs> Imaging of the lima to LAD or not. So we actually take these patients and look at the, look at the stent, look at the um, uh, lima to LAD anastomosis simultaneously, and I have to say we're doing more and more of these cases in the hybrid lab so that it's easy to do both procedures simultaneously. We also have to manage the antiplatelet therapy. And I said, as I said, these patients have to be able to tolerate dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, in addition, 
Is it a drug eluting stent or is it a bare metal stent? Well, look at <clears throat> some of the advantages here to actually doing the hybrid revascularization first, the PCI first. First of all, you minimize the risk of ischemia during the uh, minimally invasive cabbage. So you're really leaving it up to the vices of the levita LAD. Um, conventional uh, cabbage itself is a fallback if there's a suboptimal PCI result. So if we're not happy with that stent or with the result that, that we achieved, we can go and perform routine cabbage through a sternotomy if we needed to and place a vein graft distal to that stent. Um, Hybrid coronary revascularization, revascularization is still a possibility in the setting of PCI for uh, an acute MI and uh, a bare metal with a bare metal stent. So if a bare metal stent was placed, we can still do this robotically and, uh, and place the lima to the LAD. Um, the most active <coughs> lesion in the non-LAD vessel is what we like to stent first. So the non-culprit lesion uh, is what we would try to stent first in doing the, the actual PCI first. In addition, there's no special equipment and no special operating suite necessary in order to do this. You take the patient to the ordinary cath lab where they perform every cath every day. Now, what are the cons of doing the PCI first? Well, there's a risk of stent thrombosis with discontinuation of the antiplatelet therapy um, and inflammation uh, after the minimally invasive uh, coronary bypass. Now, we don't like to take patients on Plavix and, and other platelet uh, inhibitors to the OR why they bleed. Um, and when you're doing this minimally invasively, there's, there's a lot of er there are a lot of areas where there may be bleeding that you are not, you are not able to visualize. That lima to LAD, the actual mammary bed where you've taken down, that pedicle can bleed extensively on the dual platelet therapy. Um, again, not every case, but it does happen. As I said, there's an increased risk of bleeding when you perform the minimally invasive cabbage on the dual antiplatelet therapy. And lastly, um, they don't routinely uh, image the lima to the LAD anastomosis. And if we're going to do this, if we're going to do this procedure, we want to visualize even the, the lima to LAD anastomosis. So we don't get a chance to do that unless the patient goes back to the cath lab yet again, and then they're opened up to that risk of uh, repeated intervention. Well, what's the pro of doing this simultaneously, where we do the coronary bypass robotically and the PCI at the same time? Well, first of all, we're able to immediately visualize our work, all right? And as surgeons, you can well understand that we want to be able to see the effect of what we did, and it's got to be a good result um, or we're not happy. Um, there is aggressive PCI uh, of complex lesions that's possible when there's a patent lima to LAD stent. This is certainly something that's of benefit. So if there's, if there's a lesion that's more complex in the non-LAD system, and now you've protected this patient by performing that lima to LAD first, you can attack that complex lesion um, almost with impunity, or with certainty at least, that you're not going to make your lima to LAD, your LAD territory ischemic. Um, in addition, we can perform complete revascularization um, out of the operating room. So we're not actually in the operating room doing this. We're doing the PCI, we're doing the lima to LAD, all in a hybrid lab, um, and we're, we're taking it completely, the entire procedure, out of the OR itself. And it can be done when, there's an act, when the active lesion is the LAD or non-LAD lesion. Again, this is doing it simultaneously. Now, what are the disadvantages of doing this simultaneously? Well, first of all, the bleeding risk with the, the dual antiplatelet therapy at the time of surgery. Secondly, the inflammatory reaction of surgery and the risk of future stent thrombosis. That's a significant problem. In addition, renal injury. We're not putting these patients on bypass, but now you're giving them contrast. And so that patient that has chronic kidney disease that um, you're now giving some more contrast to might not, might not react favorably to the procedure. And in addition, logistical issues that we deal with every day uh, in the operating room and cath lab together. Uh, lastly, economic issues. The economic issue of using a hybrid lab for this procedure versus the cath lab or the operating room uh, is significant. However, I will say that on this last topic, um, we have actually written a paper at Montefiore where we looked at the uh, cost effectiveness 
of doing this procedure in the hybrid room, and it's actually very cost effective done in the hybrid room done simultaneously. Now, what about <clears throat> the minimally invasive cabbage followed by the PCI? Again, uninterrupted platelet therapy. Get the angiographic, we visualize that leaving the LED, PCI and the lesions, no special equipment, no new process of care variables. In addition, we can perform the PCI, PCI anywhere from one day to six weeks after surgery. What's the disadvantage? Well, minimally invasive cabbage is performed in the setting of residual coronary lesions. So those coronary lesions have not been dealt with yet and you're performing your uh, cabbage. It's not a good strategy when there's a tight active lesion in a non-LED vessel. So if that lesion is 90, 95% stenotic, uh, not a good idea to perform it in that fashion. At Montefiore, we're part of the uh, NHLBI, which is the National Heart and Lung Blood Institute um, trial. And us, as well as uh, all these other facilities that you see listed here, um, Entered, a tr entered into a trial and collected data on actual hybrid revascularization versus percutaneous uh, PCI, um, and it was a planning grant that we established with the NIH. Now, when we looked at this, we wanted to look at what the specific aim aims of the trial would be. First of all, we wanted to explore a real-world population that would undergo hybrid revascularization and assess or address the feasibility of recruitment into a randomized controlled trial. And that's the key point. We wanted to assess the management practices for, for hybrid coronary revascularization. And we wanted to explore the adverse coronary event rate in a defined population that underwent multi-vessel PCI and a population undergoing hybrid revascularization. This is what the population looked like. So essentially, there were two cohorts. The first cohort had 6,600 patients that were enrolled uh, for angiogram review. Of those 6,000 uh, 6, patients, 3,700 had significant coronary disease. 454 of those patients were anatomically eligible for hybrid coronary revascularization. And 169 of those who were eligible were then brought over into the cohort B patients. And of those patients, 90 patients, plus an additional 208 patients, brought us down to randomizing patients to approximately 200 to the hybrid coronary revascularization rates and 98 patients with PCI using a drug eluding stent. Once again, the important thing here, surgeon and interventional cardiologists reviewed almost 6,700 um, angiograms. In addition, 3,700 of those patients demonstrated coronary disease, so that's about 55% of the population, and 44% of those patients did not demonstrate any coronary disease. So our population that we're dealing with is the population on the left here. Once again, about 84% of those patients were anatomically not candidates for hybrid coronary revascularization, whether that was on, based upon angiographic uh, anatomy or physical anatomy. Of that number, as shown earlier, 454 were candidates, and then there were 113, 113 patients where we actually had no consensus, but that number was very low. It was only 3% of the patients. So um, once again, the number we're looking at is 454. So how did we decide that this was a good way to look at this? Well, first of all, the interventional, cardi uh, interventional cardiologists and cardiac surgeons, we actually wanted to demonstrate that there was some, some concordance in agreement as to whether these patients were uh, eligible for the procedure. So we looked at greater than 6,500 patients when you look at um, the, um, the eligibility and ineligible criteria for this procedure, and you look at that across the board, where they agreed and where they disagreed, as you can see, the number of, of times that we disagreed um, was actually very small and um, signi uh, not significant. So the that was with a 95% confidence interval. So, um, Again, it showed that we had some meaningful uh, relationships with our interventional cardiology colleagues in terms of um, whether these patients were going to be suitable candidates or not. And again, that's what I demonstrated. Now, what are some of the reasons for anatomic ineligibility when the cardiologists or surgeons disagreed on eligibility for, 
hybrid coronary vascularization? Well, first of all, if we said the patients, if the cardiologist said the patient was ineligible and the surgeon said the patient was eligible, we had 85 patients like that. And in the study I'm speaking about, not Montefiore specifically. What are the criteria here? Well, 60 of them had complex disease. 10 of them, single vessel disease. Um, no significant disease, only about six. Um, LED, prior cabbage, there were two patients. The LED was deemed not graftable in one, and there were some other um, uh, reasons as well. When you look at where the cardiologist said the patient was eligible and the surgeon said the patient was ineligible, once again, complex disease, nine, single vessel, two, very small numbers all across the board. But <clears throat> again, when you look at what the real goal was here, was we wanted to study what's, what's here at the end, and that is these 200 patients that were eligible, and we want to be able to randomize those patients into the 200 that were treated with hybrid coronary vascularization, and the 98 that just were treated with PCI using a drug eluting stent. That was what really interested us. So when we looked at the population of patients that we had across all of these facilities that were involved in the NHLBI trial, um, this was the breakdown. So at Montefiore, we actually had a very favorable number of patients that underwent um, hybrid coronary revascularization and PCI. And that basically stems from the fact that we have a good working relationship with our interventionalists. And I have to say that when we talk to them, we talk at, in, either in group or we speak one-on-one uh, -on -one with them, and we're pretty much able to come to a decision as to whether a patient is going to be eligible or not. Um, relatively quickly. When you look at some of the other centers, they're more heavily weighted towards the hybrid coronary revascularization or PCI, depending on the location of the facility and the lab itself. When we look at the type of surgical procedure that was actually done on those 200 patients that we said were randomized, um, these are the various procedures that were performed. Only 11 patients had planned sternotomy. Um, and again, when you look at the percentages, it's low, it's 5%. Most of the patients had some sort of an endothoracic endo, um, uh, uh, atraumatic coronary bypass, either using robotic takedown of the lima or thoracoscopic takedown of the lima, and that number, obviously, 53%. Okay? Now, <clears throat> when you look at the location of the procedure, so how many of these procedures were done in what location? 142 of these procedures across all these institutions in total were done in the operating room. That basically took, accounted for 70% of the procedures. Um, only 50 cases were done in a hybrid suite, and 10% of them uh, were, 10 of them were actually missing the data. So again, majority of these cases um, at the time of this trial were done in the operating room. Now, when you look at what the strategy was here, we took our 200 patients that were eligible for hybrid revascularization. 21% of those patients received PCI first and then had their hybrid coronary revascularization. Simultaneous, only 15%. And these are the patients that were most likely done in a, in a hybrid lab at one of the institutions. And then 55% had the uh, minimally invasive uh, cabbage first and then the PCI. And that number was about 110 of the patients, or 55% uh, overall. When we looked at what the timing was, um, <clears throat> we looked at number of days between the patient that had the LAD done first with the hybrid coronary vascularization, or those that had the PCI first, 108 versus 45. Um, when you looked at the, the absolute uh, standard deviation, the mean number of days here uh, between the procedures was 17, um, and in those that had PCI first, 20, so roughly about the same. Important thing to look at, what were the adverse uh, event rates at a year? Well, when you look at the 200 patients that underwent hybrid coronary revascularization, and you look at those that underwent PCI, um, the things that are, that are significant are obvious. Um, there were three deaths, there were four MIs, there were five strokes, um, and there were uh, 14 revascularizations in the uh, hybrid group. And if you look at the PCI group, um, they only had one death, three MIs, and then eight that required re-intervention or revascularization uh, with the stent. Um, 
The important thing is the mean number of months for the, the patients that underwent uh, hybrid coronary vascularization and their stroke rates uh, in those in those uh, five patients were at the at the months out that you see there, which is two, two and a half, four, uh, 0.6, six, six, and nine. Uh, and that mean averaged out to about four and a half months after the uh, last stage of the hybrid coronary vascularization. Um, when we look at the total uh, study period, the overall study period, which had a uh, mean follow-up of 17 months plus or minus six and a half months, once again, numbers remain uh, about similar, about the same, um, except uh, any mace now number 12 in the PCI group, but otherwise the remainder of the numbers remain the same. So what does that, what does that tell us about the procedure? Well, first of all, we know that the procedure, the procedure is a safe procedure to perform. And ideally today, we're performing this procedure simultaneously. So with the advent of the cath lab, which was not in vogue at the time that we did this trial um, a year and a half ago, um, now today, Simultaneous PCI and hybrid coronary vascularization is what we're doing, um, and that certainly has been shown to um, uh, increase our survival uh, or or event event free survival, I should say, not increase our survival overall. But the limited LED patency, as I said, is what purports that survival benefit for us. So, in conclusion, hybrid coronary vascularization is a strategy which promises to augment advantages of both minimally invasive surgery and PCI together in selected, properly selected patients. Specific patient and angiographic characteristics need to be looked at critically to really decide whether these situations are ideal for hybrid revascularization. Simultaneous and staged approaches may be chosen uh, based on the patient and the clinical scenario at hand. And there has to be equipoise for a rigorous comparative uh, effectiveness trial comparing both hybrid coronary vascularization and multi-vessel PCI. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? You, you do have you do have higher uh, event, you know, adverse events noted with these things. I will tell you this is on most of these are all beating heart. Um, there is a there is a higher stroke rate with that. Um, you're manipulating again whether the when you do this simultaneously it's hard to know where that stroke originated again you're if, that's why we 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 did it simultaneously we don't know whether doing it before after or otherwise is better the patients could very well have had a stroke because of the manipulation of the aorta when we do the actual lima to LAD takedown and the anastomosis to the heart there's minimal uh, manipulation of anything really from the surgical standpoint, the only thing that comes into play is now passing the wires through. So that's really probably what's what gives you the adverse event rate that you that you're seeing here, especially the stroke rate um, when you do it simultaneously, because you don't you simply don't know when the stroke is occurring. We don't manipulate the aorta at all, so um, it's unlikely that that would be the cause. Are those numbers or percentages? These are numbers. I mean, you have twice as many uh, numbers on the web. Your percentages wouldn't look as bad as the actual numbers. Right? right. You're correct. That's correct. The percentages are low. When you look at the actual percentage of the number of patients, they're low. The actual stroke rate for uh, open coronary bypass surgery is 1 to 3%. And this actually is lower than that. Yeah, that means that it's active for hybrid. Well, I know the LED is approachable easily from the hybrid. So what about the circumflex in that point? So <coughs> is that included in the anatomical? So it was so here we looked at just the Lima to LED. Um, however, I will say that we do frequently we will bypass a diagonal vessel, especially if it's in continuity with that LED and there's a stenosis um, proximal to the takeoff of a diagonal. We've also um, approached the ramus vessel with the LAD as well. So when there's a high OM or ramus vessel that comes off very close to where the takeoff of the LAD is off the CERC, we will we have placed the, the lima to the ramus in those patients. So there's no LAD disease and there's isolated ramus disease. We have used the lima, especially in young folks. 
We've used that uh, internal memory and brought that over to the Ramus. It's very easily done because it's very close to where the LED is. Is the right corner the No, the right corner is not It's a it's a struggle. It's been it's been done. I won't say that it's not been done, but it involves lifting up the heart and trying to see the right coronary or a PDA. Um, it has been done, but it takes a lot of time to do it. And the patients usually get unstable in doing so because of the manipulation of the heart that's necessary. Uh, was the uh, procedure done simply based on anatomical findings, or what, did the patient have any assessment of ischemia, which, which territories were ischemic? The reason I ask is that uh, I, I, I would find it uh, problematic to uh, try to uh, put a stent into an artery that's clinically stable. And I think it's simply inviting problems, you know, complications of that procedure, unless that vessel is actively ischemic or causing symptoms for the patient. Right. You're, you're absolutely correct. A patient, a patient that has a culprit lesion, so the lesion that's actually causing the patient the ischemia, causing the patient the chest pain, so forth. When you when you put a you put a stent in a in a lesion such as that, um, you're you're not immune to a complication or to an adverse event, but one thing that you can say is if you're stenting something that's um, the culprit lesion, the lesion that's causing the patient their symptoms, um, you accept those risks more easily, as opposed to placing a stent in a lesion that's not a culprit lesion, and now let's say the patient has a stroke, or you've had a lesion that angiographically looked significant but again, today we have other methods of measuring that lesion. So intravascular ultrasound, uh, IVIS, uh, fra uh, fractional free reserve, all those things are, are methods that we employ today to look at those lesions that we're really not sure of um, as to their degree of stenosis. Because again, it's only an estimation. When we look at the catheterization, it's only an estimation. It's not, we can't actually give you a defined number that the vessel is precisely 60% because it's dynamic, it's contracting and, and moving. There's one, one other point about the degree of stenosis as we know from recent data. The degree of stenosis doesn't predict the eventual uh, coronary syndrome or acute MI. In fact, it may be paradoxically and inversely proportional. It's the non-obstructive lesion that may lead to an acute event. So just going after the severe obstruction doesn't necessarily prevent coronary events. That's correct. Absolutely. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you.